Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Malia Sanford, and I am the Programs and Outreach Manager at the Lopez Island Library. And this is a special recording that we are doing. Um, the recording is taking place on Wednesday, August 12th, um, and then it will be broadcast. You'll be watching this either on Friday, August 14th, or afterwards. Um, and that just seems worth mentioning because things change so quickly um, that who knows where the world will be when you're watching this. Um, but I just want to launch right in and welcome the other panelists for this evening's program and ask everyone to introduce themselves, starting with um, Paul Lewis, please. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Paul. I live on Lopez and um, lived here for about 30 years. And I am a therapist uh, working in private practice and mostly with public entities like the Family Resource Center and school districts. Um, I also coordinate the PIP program, which is a play therapy program at the Lopez Elementary School. And I am an on-call uh, crisis response person in the county. So I wear a few different hats there. That's, that's me. Great. And then going down the screen, Richard. Yeah, hi. My name is Richard Uri. Uh, I work with uh, San Juan County Health and Community Services in their Human Services Division. I was actually onboarded five months ago, a few days before the lockdown. So uh, everything I know about my job, I've learned remotely. Prior to that, I was a clinician at Compass Health, uh, specializing in substance use disorders. And uh, I'm still, uh, no matter what my position is, uh, um, advocacy is my mandate and advocating for the recovery community and other folks whose, whose voices aren't always being heard is uh, my passion. Nice to meet you, Richard. Okay, and then Amy, you remember to unmute yourself and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Amy Ray, and I also live on Lopez. Um, I'm a therapist and also in private practice and working with um, public entities, such as Paul said. Um, I work for the Family Resource Center and do some work um, through um, the county mental health program um, for the school. And I also do um, a little bit of supervision through a mentor program that the Family Resource Center has. And also um, I do volunteer um, with the PIP program um, with Paul at the school, but do some supervision over at um, our children's center here on Lopez regarding the PIP program. And, you know, my background is primarily in social work and um, so I too also have a great passion for um, social justice. And I really just um, really love this community as I you know, find myself living here for a longer period of time. I used to go back and forth between Lopez and, and Hawaii and I'm here permanently now and have been um, for almost the last two years. And it's just really become um, an integral part and very you know, meaningful to me for me to be a part of this community. Thanks, Amy. Okay, and then um, Trillium. <clears throat> Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Trillium Swanson. I'm over here on Orcas Island and was really happy through uh, collaboration with the Lopez Island Prevention Coalition and the Orcas Island Prevention Coalition, named aptly the Coalition for Orcas Youth. Um, uh, we decided to to have me join as well in this conversation. Um, the Coalition for Orcas Youth is one uh, way that I communicate or uh, participate in our community. I project manage that coalition in addition to being a, a licensed mental health counselor associate um, in private practice here for the last three years working um, Pre-COVID, working primarily outdoors with all of my clients and in COVID, uh, happy to have recently in the last few weeks returned to meeting outdoors again with folks and uh, looking forward to seeing how this conversation unfolds tonight. 
Great, yeah. Okay, and then Catherine, if you just want to give a brief intro of yourself as well. Yeah, I'm Catherine, and I'm the um, program coordinator for the Lopez Island Prevention Coalition, as Trillian mentioned. And we're just really grateful to the library and to Malia for uh, making this collabor collaboration happen, and to all you wonderful therapists who agreed to join our uh, discussion tonight. And I'm hopeful about uh, outcomes we will come to together through our conversation. So thank you. Yeah, so thank you all for being here. And um, we thought it would be important to just mention at the beginning of the program, if you are looking um, for mental health support or for some resources, um, maybe a good place for us to start is just to mention ways that people watching this, so on the islands most likely, um, how they can access uh, mental health support right now. Um, Paul, do you, do anyone can <laughs> <find it? laughs> Um Well, the, we've mentioned the Family Resource Center a few times here, and both Amy and I contract with the Lopez Family Resource Center. There's the Community Wellness Program, which is an amazing program that provides uh, mental health services for individuals and families. And so that's one place to, to start, and Contessa, uh, is the contact person there for that program. And um, for kids, there's the working through the school can is a great resource too. There's Gina Carter at the school who's a school counselor and there's a school-based mental health program. So there's uh, financial assistance for um, counseling for, for kids. And um, and then there's there is a resource guide that the the family resource center has that has a list of therapists that are available in the the community um, to people. So that's off the top of my head. That's at least on Lopez Island um, what's available. Yeah, Trillium. Yeah, and to, to underline as well that the community wellness program is available to community members on all three islands and um, on San Juan and Orcas, you can also um, access information and application for that program through the Community Resource Center. Um, the, it's called the Resource Center on San Juan at this point as well, right? The Joy Sobel Resource Center. Yeah. Yeah. You, Depen Richard? Depending on what day you ask, it could be the Family Resource Center or the long form. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, and that program, you are only eligible for that program to receive um, subsidy for counseling if you are not on Medicaid or Medicare. You can apply. Okay, and I will also create links on um, the website for, on the Lopez Library website for those sites as well. Um, okay, well, oh, Richard. Yeah, I, I just would like to mention that since, uh, especially since COVID has started, the county website has done a huge push to incorporate all of those uh, links as well. And I know, I'm just gonna be honest, nobody really likes spending a lot of time on the county website, you know? <laughs> it looks big and official and everything, but if you get onto that front page and click on the COVID resources, you're right there and there's a mental health resource page where you can find call lines that aren't necessarily for crisis, call, just to talk, just so if yeah. you don't have someone to listen to you, you know? And, uh, and also guide you towards mental health and substance use services. Yeah, it's actually a fairly concise and well-organized compendium of, of local resources. You'd be surprised. Yeah. <laughs> Amy, did you have something to add? Yeah, I just, I did just want to add, and this is like, of course, up to each individual therapist, and I'm not always sure how people are navigating with this, but I, I do want to always make sure that mental health support services are available to anyone. So um, I think there's a lot of us that are willing to work on a sliding scale. I mean, Catherine knows I've been paid in eggs and salsa. <laughs> 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 um, 
And you know, <clears throat> sometimes that works. So I just, I feel, especially during this time, I, I, I'm really um, feel like it should, yeah, it should be easy and available to anybody who's seeking it. So that's just a really important thing to know too. Family Resource Center is incredible here. They, no matter what, um, they're very flexible and creative and they make and they make things happen. And, and, and truth be told, I mean, with these times, more and more people as we are just having to adapt and be more flexible, we're all kind of doing some kind of telehealth something. So, I mean, the good thing to know is that, you know, for whatever reason that people are seeking or exploring those too, those services that are provided online and available to people. Yeah. Um, just to note tech, the technical, we are aware of Amy's feedback. And so we're just trying to work with that because we couldn't figure it out, uh, but that's okay. So, um, so we are going to get to some very sort of specific questions that people have written in, but to start off with more generally, um, it would be nice to hear from all of you how it's going in your practices um, and what you're noticing perhaps um, maybe shifts or some commonalities of what people are dealing with right now um, that you could possibly tr attribute to the, the, the crisis situation that um, the pandemic has sort of put our nation in. Um, and let's just, we'll start, we'll go in the same order that you guys introduced yourselves in. So we'll start with Paul. Oh, okay. <laughs> Unless um, you don't want to start, Paul. <laughs> no, that's, that's okay. I, I think if, if there is any fortunate um, circumstance of how the pandemic started was that it was, it sort of became most severe in the springtime. So we were entering into some better weather and I think that was actually a really fortunate circumstance for a lot of people because what I've been mostly hearing where people have been going to take care of themselves to nurture themselves and to um, kind of get relief is going outside and um, and so and there has been a lot of stress, distress, economic hardship, um, and that looks like it will be, you know, is is going to continue into the fall. And we don't know all the how things are going to unfold. But I feel really fortunate that we live in a place that has such natural beauty, and people can access places where. They can social distance and and have space outside, which is quite different than an urban environment where things could be quite different in negotiating, you know, social distancing. Um, in my own practice, like Trillium, I've been um, meeting with people outside, going for walks on the beach, um, going for bike rides with kids. Um, and then Amy and I have been involved in a program this summer with uh, middle school age kids from the Lopez School that we've called the Hero's Journey, which has been a weekly outdoor program where we've been doing equine, ther uh, equine therapy and mindfulness practices and outdoor explorations. And that's been really great to get kids outside after having such a period of being, you know, yoked to their screens, you know, during the, the school virtual uh, learning time. Um, so I'll say that much about as an encouragement, go outside, <laughs> it's available to us. And it's such it's such good medicine. Yeah. I feel like maybe we don't need to be so like, Everyone go in order. So if anyone just wants to share, right in. I'm ready anyway. Yeah, go ahead, Richard. <laughs> All right. So I, I have a couple capacities to the uh, perspectives to look at this from. My role with the county uh, for the COVID response is uh, behavioral health liaison. And in that role, I do outreach with providers um, and clinics and resource centers and uh, throughout the week and try to gauge what's going on. So I get to hear a lot of, I think, the kind of things like Paul shared from providers. But I still do um, 
pro bono counseling in the recovery community quite a bit. And so I think that my that uh, I would like to talk about the trends and changes that I'm seeing in the re, in the recovery community from substance use disorders specifically. And uh, one is the absence of organized AA meetings and uh, no more group therapy at Compass. And this has been very impactful. It's uh, uh, it's reduced the amount of people willing to engage. It has become a barrier for maintaining recoveries. Um, and uh, as, as any of you know who have worked with substance use, you know, it, it, anything can be a barrier. But when you've got these, uh, you know, unquestionable uh, global scale trauma events <laughs> happening with this, uh, the economy, the um, pandemic, you know, we're, we're looking at heading into a not good weather in a few months. <laughs> and uh, a lot of us are seasonally affected too. So. There's so much to keep track of and, and without um, the in-person self-help meetings or the group therapy, it's been uh, really hard on people who are in the recovery community. And for people who aren't necessarily um, dealing with disorder level use, we're seeing a high level of co comorbidity uh, of substance use with other conditions where it wasn't there before. And uh, in my outreach and in my talks to people in the community about this, because I'm always asking people, how are you, you know? Uh, and one of the things that keeps coming up is folks that uh, you would drink occasionally or rarely are noticing they're having a glass of wine every single night or that, and, and they're not noticing until we start talking. So it's kind of, this change is happening in their decision-making process without them noticing. So those are some things I've noticed uh, that COVID has done change uh, as far as changes in the uh, substance use world. Um, I just want to apologize for my chirping birds or whatever is coming through the, the audio. Um, I also want to just um, speak to the fact of some, you know some of the changes that I've seen in my practice. You know, one where um, there are old clients that have been really stable that I haven't seen for quite some time are coming back and um, requesting appointments, and it's primarily due to all the ambivalence and and changes related or how they've been impacted by COVID and the um, uncertainty. You know, um, another thing that I have been seeing is more children and adolescents in my practice. Um, big changes in their life, big, you know, uncertainty. And, you know, I mean, it's critical for all of us in terms of connecting socially, but, you know, um, the children and the youth here have been really, um, noticing i mean some people are starting to kind of see their friends outside here and there but in terms of like a larger um how they were interfacing in, with each other in classes um paul and i know that um a child in one of the 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 group that we were running the outside um group experience in the hero's journey i mean one of the boys pointed out like even though they're middle schoolers and that's typically a time where they're becoming more awkward with the opposite sex and all those things are kind of occurring he he shared that it's even more awkward because he's he doesn't get to where you would be seeing people in your class and normally engaging with them and interfacing with them you're not so you have this big span of time it's not like it's normal summer vacation some of these kids haven't seen each other since you know march so so there's that and and I think one of the things that I've noticed that I've been kind of talking to when I'm looking at the differences in the change in my practice is um, within myself, I'm noticing a sense of urgency. And that sense of urgency is actually weather related, um, like Paul and Richard were kind of talking about. You know, a lot of people are outside enjoying the sun, enjoying this weather and feeling a little bit more optimistic. And I just feel the sense of urgency to help my clients become more stable and a little bit higher level of concern for people who might not necessarily um, be able to feel that hopefulness. So as we head towards darker times, shorter days, you know, different weather where people can't be outside, you know, it, it's, it's a bit of concern, um, you know, for people to feel like they can in, in for this long term for this winter time, have some resilience or feel like there's some, some hope that can sustain them, you know, some, some light. 
So yeah, I, I feel a different sense of urgency that feels more time constraints where I really want people to be stable as we head into these, um, yeah, the winter months. Yeah, um, so a couple of things come to mind. One is uh, on, a, on a community level um, within my work in prevention, which could be otherwise phrased as wellness promotion. Um, and in, in my case and in, in Catherine's work with the Coalition for Youth on, on Lopez, that's focused, that's youth focused, um, but that's constantly looking at the health overall of the community because we raise young people. And so on that note of, you know, what changes? What changes when COVID comes? And uh, some of the early discussion and, and some of the kind of cultural assumptions that we made around substance use, um, for one, was that it would increase, right? Like alcohol was flying off the shelves just as toilet paper was. And so I just want to make make a pitch that I um, think is really, really important that we bring into these conversations around mental health and comorbidity with substance use is that what we actually found with a lot of studies and even just, um, so it was particularly a study I'm talking about was conducted at the University of Washington amongst students uh, who have a higher use rate um, than the general population uh, regardless. Uh, but there actually wasn't an increase uh, on, there was not a market increase in use, certainly not that was like sort of being headlined and described, which is really heartening. And uh, the professional Richard and Catherine, and I, I think Catherine too, right? We're all in a training with a, a czar of prevention at the UW and he likened it to like, would you assume that people were using more toilet paper and wiping their butts more because they were buying so much toilet paper? Behavior was actually in hoarding and a lot of people um, stopped using as much because they were socially drinking previous. And then those with, and this is something that Richard pointed out a couple months ago, those with a tendency toward using addiction or using use as a coping mechanism did that more and are, are if unmitigated, continuing to do so. Um, and so it remains a concern within our community. And there are people who are really vulnerable to that right now with less supports, but just to, just to put that out there. Um, and then I think the one thing that really sticks out to me the most um, within my practice, um, I work with a lot of youth and, and adults, um, but I'm young, look young. I'll probably, I think my practice will age as I age, but I'm definitely like a youth plus my life is about young people. Um, but I have found it really interesting that, so anxiety, right? Like anxiety loves avoidance and loves being able to hide from just naturally, unconsciously, just avoiding um, any situation that causes you distress, like parking or going to the store. And so what I found in these last couple of months um, with like Amy was saying, clients who have actually come back um, after a time of really like developing skills and, and feeling ready to go and live their lives is coming back to be like, so I haven't gone, I'm like, I'm afraid of parking again, right? Or like whatever it is, like I am feeling really uncomfortable doing these things that I had really gotten to a place of, of ableness and then I just got out of practice and I really need to build those skills back up. And so with students who are anxious and social anxiety, um, there is a real, um, there's a real loss for them that's hard for us to even mimic and create practice around in our sessions while they're still unable to put themselves in those situations. So there is, as we proceed in isolation, a continued loss um, while they're building amazing other skills and flourishing in different directions. But that's something long term that I really have my eyes on uh, with, particularly with um, anxiety and OCD type behaviors in general. And it's interesting um, that Shirley is speaking to that because also, you know, one of the things that I know we can continue to talk about tonight is like situational depression. But situational depression, this situational depression has tacked on longer months and it's going on longer and it could go on. And so 
we could still, you know, situational depressions, you know, it could become very wearing because it doesn't feel very temporary anymore. Like we're switching that this is our new norm. And even when we come back from this, we're all saying that things are going to be different. We're going to be different as a result of it. So yeah, situational, you know, or adjustment disorder, you know, all this terminology that we use, it's now all of a sudden gone into this longer period. And people are, people are being, you know, taxed by it, you know, and, you know, of course, at the essence of all of this is fear. And, and, and fear is, um, can be very crippling. And so it's one of those things and it, it, and it is pervasive and it can invade all different types of arenas. So it's really important because one of the things that, um, you know, that being such a dominant, you know, survival mechanism, emotion, primary emotion, it's one of the ways that to, to counter it, um, there's lots of barriers to how we counter that now, you know, in terms of connection and socialization, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it's, it's really um, kind of an interesting time and to take kind of this, to document this, you know, right now and, and really understand when we come out on the other side, because we're not totally sure that all the impacts yet, right? Right. Yes. Well, um, thank you all for sharing what you are noticing and experiencing and it's heavy stuff. And my hope is that with some of these questions, um, we're not offering big solutions, but more sort of process strategies uh, that people can potentially go to, um, to help um, themselves and the people around them. Um, so we, we got some questions that Catherine and I are going to um, ask of the group and people, you all are just welcome to answer um, as you are led. I will call on you if many hands are raised. Um, but let's just start with kind of the, what, what we were just talking about, which is anxiety. Um, we got a question, how can I reduce the anxiety I'm feeling? especially its effects on my sleep. Uh, I'll, I'll try to field this one. Since it's something that uh, I can relate to and, and go through myself. And uh, I think that one of, the, one of the best ways to wear ourselves out is to have some kind of physical activity. I know that's a pretty well-known coping skill. But I was very active at the gym and running and stuff. And then the gym closed. And for a while, I could work out at home. And then I started getting really tired of my dining room being my office and my gym and my dining room. And it, it got harder and harder. So I guess one of the things we can do is try to um, find different ways of doing the same things, for lack of a, of a better way to put it. Uh, maybe adjusting our sense of purpose a little within the day. Um, we used to look forward to planning trips or seeing family or having a birthday party. And those things kind of all got taken off the table for an indefinite amount of time. So now uh, in our house, we're trying to find purpose in different things, like trying a really difficult recipe, or make a souffle, or you know, we're picking these strange personal goals and it's becoming fun uh, as would all those more external things. So um, sleep is a tough one if you already have sleep issues, especially, but I think finding a way to, to get that energy out in other ways and, uh, and not bring it uh, to bed with us is, is my suggestion. Um, I'll, I'll chime in a little bit on the anxiety issue. You know, um, Trillium was saying that anxiety uh, likes avoidance, I guess, or it, avoidance can provoke anxiety. And on the other side of that, the, the, our psyches, our brains really respond to repetition, and that can be in either direction. So there is this caution, you know, where we stop doing things that were regular things. And that's true for social engagement, physical activity, um, those types of things. So the, on the other side of things, like 
being intentional about increasing other activities that are available to us, the brain really responds to that when we repeat something over and over again, and then it can become maybe a, a healthy habit. Like Richard, I, I swam at the pool and then the pool closed. Mm -hmm. And that was like my regular physical, you know, aerobic activity. And so there was an adjustment that I, I needed to make. And for a while, I just wasn't doing it, wasn't doing something as much self care. And I think looking towards the fall in a preventative way really does require like increasing self care on a number of different levels. And um, anxiety is is a is a hard one, but it can be mitigated by um, increasing kind of intentional activities. And so those might be mindfulness activities, meditation, breathing. Um, and there are a lot of resources available there. There's a lot of phone apps um, for mindfulness activities and breathing um, practices. Um, and for sleep, you know, there was a, a phrase coined a, that is sleep hygiene, you know, which is about well, how do we how do we clean up our our um, our routine in order to um, at least create the best environment for a good night of sleep? And so, you know, you know, with kids, it's definitely about screen time and proximity to <clears throat> um, going to bed. We we're talked about substance use, definitely alcohol use within you know a certain number of hours. And Richard, you can be more specific about this, but um, before bed is going to affect the sleep cycle. And um, and then the encouragement would be to create new rituals before sleep. You know, like of turning off the devices. You know, reading a book or or reading. Um, you know, put it, putting uh, positive affirmations as a um, as before sleep as a way of entering into sleep, making a hot cup of tea, or you know, just creating rituals before sleep that are going to, and then repeating those night after night. And the body does also best respond to a regular time to go to bed, which is not always possible if you have a, a baby in the house. Um, maybe it's unpredictable, but um, and and there are some things that we cannot control in terms of our nightly sleep, but creating rituals ahead of the sleep time is a good encouragement. I wonder um, that if I could ask a related question uh, that also came in, which is just how can those, those of us out there with um, other people in our homes uh, and young people in our homes, are there ways that we as parents and partners can help others um, deal with their stress and anxiety? Especially um, kids, I'm thinking of. For I don't, we don't have to talk about everyone so generally. How can parents help kids um, who are feeling stressed right now? I think it's really helpful also to just, you know, be aware that children um, are listening to radio, they're listening to news, they're picking up on, you know, media, and it's you know helpful to just check in with kids and you know, ask them, you know, depending on where they're at developmentally, like what, if they have any questions, if they have any concerns, how the family is keeping themselves safe, you know, and how re reminders of like, um, you know, and it could be just simply going to that gratitude, you know, sometimes sharing the highs and lows of the day, you know, a little bit, just making it that safe space where it's normal to be talking about those feelings. It's normal to be having questions and concerns and, you know, it could be, um, you, you know, these are some of the things that I'm seeing in practice. There was um, a child that there had been some plans pre-COVID to go to Arizona. And so she held on to this fear because she said, you know, I don't want to go to Arizona because that's where all the dead people are. 
because she had been hearing on the news that the, like the high numbers of the cases over there. And so she had been carrying around that fear or carrying around the fear that her, if her mom went to the store too long, you know, um, just being concerned about that. So sometimes kids are not sharing those simple things that those burdens, those worries that they're carrying around. So it's, it's really just a good idea to make that like a general, like kind of daily check-in, you know, it doesn't always have to be about COVID, but just also just about feelings, you know, any kind of worries where they might be holding that in their body. Mm -hmm. Um, I still love that tradition, you know, that, that, um, where they have the little Guatemalan, the, the little worry dolls that they would give to children before, and they would put, tell their worries to the dolls before they went to sleep and then put them under their pillow. You know, it's, it's just other ways of, you know, like journaling or writing down some of the things your to-do list or things that you're ruminating over before you go to bed so that there's like, again, a ritual around, you know, closing that book and feeling like I don't need to look at this until tomorrow. I just need rest because it's, you know, so restorative. Yeah. I uh, agree with that check-in. That was the first thing that popped in my head is just talk to them, you know, with an, an open heart. And, and I would add to that, we need to model openness for kids. And generationally, I come from a time when your parents didn't tell you anything and you thought they knew everything and that everything was going to be okay. They wouldn't tell you if they were afraid. They wouldn't tell you what their concerns were. And I think that was a disservice to us youngsters and, and that we should be thinking, uh, showing them that we're vulnerable too, so that it's okay. Because you could ask a kid, how are you feeling? And if all they hear is adults say, I'm fine, what do you think they're going to tell you? you know? So it's important that if we're feeling vulnerable or down, that we're okay with sharing that in a, in a healthy way that doesn't make, make them any more insecure, you know, but to, to let them know it's, it's normal and it's, and it's safe to, to share if we're not okay. Just checking in, Trillium, if you um, had any, wanted to add it before we move on to the next question. It's really unstable. I don't know if you guys can hear me or not. Oh. Everyone's frozen now. Oh, we can hear you. Yeah, I think she's having a little line issue there. Okay. I'm going to. Okay, well. Yeah. We can hear you now. We can hear you. Yeah, I don't know why it was totally working before, but now everyone's frozen. I think I should skip. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, let's see. Catherine, do you want to? Pose the next question. Yeah, definitely. Let's see. Um, uh, yeah, I, so this is a question that came in. Um, I feel stressed. Uh, should I seek therapy during this time? Is everyone feeling stressed? Um, does everyone need therapy? I know we kind of just talked about um, strategies, but like what are ways we can de-escalate our stress? and our anxiety um, in terms of uh, the longevity of COVID. Hmm. You know, I think that's a really, can you guys hear me? Am I coming? Yeah. yeah. All right, let's go with it. Um, <laughs> I think that's a, that's a question that a lot of us in, in the behavioral health field and in prevention have been talking a lot about is the, the, the space between. I feel, I feel stress and, and then picking up the phone and reaching out to a therapist or I don't feel like myself, right? Like things have not been, I know that this isn't me at my best. Um, and, and yes, of course, like we could talk about Let's what it would look like to reach out to, to a mental health counselor. Um, and, and the truth is people often wait. The, I mean, the, the kind of the study that's like often cited that I could not tell you where to find um, is that it takes up to seven years for someone to actually reach out to a counselor. She's changed so much since the last time she was on. She has so much hair now. Yeah, she's cute. She's so cute. Say something, Richard, so we can have you oh. 
fill the screen. She she wanted to say good night to everybody. Good night. <laughs> yeah. Good night. Night, night. <laughs> night night. Thank you people for helping our community. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um no. I'm real fine my train of thought. Um yeah, so it takes it takes a long time for someone who arguably maybe like absolutely needs to find a counselor, whatever that means, um, to reach out and actually make the call uh, and find one. And so what what can we do as individuals um, to really support ourselves if we do identify that we don't feel good right now in ourselves? Um, it doesn't always have to be a counselor. There's so much health. There's so much strength that we can find in um, in things that we can do short of a weekly meeting with someone. Um, and I'd love to just like, I mean, I would love to hear from you guys what, what you think about um, what some of those things are. Um, I think that for, and for many of my clients, I think that the ultimate goal, um, and some really state that is like, we'll be done. I'll know that we don't need to meet anymore when I've got um, connections, friendships in my life that I really feel like in a healthy way, I can reach out to if I need. Um, right now, I still think I need to work with you because what I'm working with is more than a friend could take, right? Um, which is one really good, I think that's a good self-check too. It's like, do I need a counselor? How burdened are my friendships right now or my relationship? Or do I not have that person who I really could be that outside perspective? For teenagers, if you're parents who are thinking about whether or not you want to refer them to a counselor, one is absolutely just an open conversation and a question of like, um, you know, do you have someone outside of your family system, parents, siblings, that you could seriously just talk to who could handle it? If you said something that, you're, that you were afraid your friends would think was weird or that you don't want to burden your friends with. Um, as a teenager, that comes up a lot. Um, and then that stuff that you can do if those questions are like check no like i do have friendships um absolutely like reaching out to those people and and those other things that you know in the past have gotten you there like first questions that i certainly as a therapist ask a client is you know when was the last time you found yourself here and how the heck did you get out of it you know what did you do what worked and, and doing some of that um, checklist stuff with yourself and seeing, have I tried it? <laughs> have I done that? Did it not work? And, and do I need to get creative? Can I, and if you can't think of the answers, then absolutely reach out. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm, I agree that sometimes people wait until things, um, you know, things, things become more patterned in, in their experience. And that can happen with depression sometimes. It, you can sort of slowly edge in that area. And I like, I like the way you frame that, Trillium, about you know, kind of assessing your resources that are around you and assessing kind of um, you know, what we in the field call baseline. Like, this is how I normally operate but I'm seeing myself really decline from that and I need to pay attention to that and, and um, take, that, take that seriously because it's part of, part of health, part of our well-being to, to take that, that seriously. Um, you know, there's also, like I wanna mention on Lopez too, there's a um, open source wellness, which is sort of uh, a, what is a program that's sort of between therapy and um, you know just you know just uh, working with your friends and family, which is about a, a wellness program that's built around kind of health coaching, and so that's through the Family Resource Center, and that might be a, a place to reach out to and just get some extra support from a peer from the peer counselor at the Family Resource Center. I would like to add that after, you know, uh, listening to Trillium just now and then uh, thinking back to some of the things that the, the panel has added, it, it, maybe it isn't uh, clear, but I think what, what the message is, is that there's a spectrum of potential reactions, 
right? And that people who are highly resilient may, uh, their needs could be met just from some open dialogue with friends. It's possible that people uh, who are keeping feelings inside, that could be enough for them, you know? And, but that self-monitoring that Paul was talking about is crucial, you know? But the idea is that if we, if we are prepared for this and talking to one another and, and open to one, one another and, and listening and modeling these kinds of, uh, these good emotional practices that not everyone will need a therapist because there isn't enough for everyone. <laughs> really, you know, it, there's, there's a, a limited capacity for outpatient engagement, at least in person in, this, in, in our county. So if we can fill those needs with, uh, with uh, the self-care and communication and purpose-driven um, approaches, it would take a lot of the relief off of the, the clinical community, I think. But don't uh, hesitate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I agree so much with what is being said. Like, ideally, in, in my ideal world, like, I feel like everybody needs therapy, including myself. I feel like it should be available to everybody, and it should be the most normal part of health and wellness. It should be a part of our curriculum. It should be a part of our um, work culture. So I, you know, um, different times we go through different things in our life, and it feels really good to just have a relationship or already have some rapport built with somebody. I mean, I'm noticing this with my old clients that are coming back right now. It's like, they're so relieved to already have the relationship established and to just hit the ground running with whatever it is, because I've got a relationship with them. There's trust already. I've got a little bit of history in the backstory and it feels like, you know, sometimes that's one of the barriers to getting therapy is that somebody feels like, I don't know this person. I'm going to have to catch them up to speed with my whole life history. I don't want to rehash all of this, which is not always the case. That's not always um, how therapy plays out, but that, that is often, you know, a misconception, you know, however, when that relationship is built, it just, you know, as you weave in and out of different things in your life, it feels really good to just be able to touch base. And I, and I feel like that's really what's happening with um, a lot of my clients that were dormant per se that are coming back right now. Yeah, absolutely. And I would, I would add too that in, in a lot of ways, um, even, you know, reaching out to someone right now, if you're just noticing uh, maybe, you know, against that checklist of, yeah, so my sleep hasn't been the same. I'm more irritable. Okay. I'll just give you right. Like my indicators personally <laughs> are that I'm just like generally more hateful. I am, I am meaner to my partner and I have just more negative thoughts. So for me, thoughts, that's like, that's a clue. Um, and like feeling, yeah, like I'll read the news and it hits me in this way. I, all, I often describe it as feeling porous, like stuff gets in deeper and faster. And that's a, that's a clue for me. And for me, it's usually recognizing it and taking a couple of days to kind of like have it. You, you have been like listening to Tara Brock podcasts. You know, I'm like going to my, my, these voices that I know just remind me of what I already knew and forgotten. And that's totally great. But if that kept on happening for another two weeks or three, that's something different. That's something that maybe I really need help in a different way for. Um, and oftentimes, especially like Amy was saying, those clients who are coming back, but, but even right now, it, it's a short-term coaching relationship where uh, like with a client who's coming back, you're just like, yeah, so this is what worked before, this worked before. Um, did you try those things? Nope. I've been really overwhelmed. I kind of slid back into a familiar depression, just needed this to like kind of motivate me and hold me accountable. Um, so in a lot of ways, I think counseling, especially when we're in a crisis time is that place of accountability. You're just going back and it's not accountability to me, though it is a relationship. It is this place that you're accountable to you and what you, what you're noticing in yourself and where you want to get to. Um, and it doesn't have to be like, the six months even, it may be four or five weeks. Well, what you're saying, Trillium, kind of leads into another question that we have, um, which is what are, and you've offered some ways that you reduce negative thinking, but what are some other ways to reduce negative thoughts and feelings, especially about how long COVID will last? 
Um, and then also, is it important to think positively? I, I, I am really drawn to be, being inspired by like personal human stories. I mean, just as much as we're inundated, you know, by the news, by it, like every day, by the changing facts, by the COVID numbers on the rise, it's just as important to search in the news. There are some very well done stories that are very meaningful and very touching and very inspirational. And I think it's important to look to that. Um, so I think that's one thing that I find myself doing. <clears throat> and again, it's like Trillium said, I mean, oftentimes, you know, there's a clue. We get very clued into the fact that something's going on with us. And, you know, when we find ourselves, I think, um, in a lot of reaction around things, I kind of try to remind myself, like, you know, it's something that I do, like work with clients, like it could be just one little piece of information that we're aware of with somebody that could be causing a trigger that can, we can just focus on that. It's, it, it's usually something that would make us, our heart space, be a little bit more open, be a little bit more empathetic or compassionate towards that person. They've either gone through a big transition. They've had a loss, you know, um, they've gone through a divorce or they're in a rough space with their child. And the minute, instead of going into this reactivity and focusing on this negativity about this person, if we can like remind ourselves of that one thing that we know about them, oftentimes we don't get the privilege of always having that kind of insight and that's a whole nother practice altogether. But what I'm speaking to mostly is just really letting your empathy around that person like, wow, it's really, they're in a tough space. They're really struggling right now. And you can kind of feel yourself soften a little bit with that, with that negativity, you know, when you can get to that place that they're a human being trying to survive right now. And that um, often can foster that, those feelings of um, empathy. I would, I would offer two things. One, um, positivity is fine. Um, I think that the words that would come that are like more meaningful to me, um, is is hope and not like i hope it's going to be sunny out tomorrow but hope like there's something in the future that i can build toward and i can get there and this has been a time where we really needed to adjust that for ourselves and find new ways of, of figuring out what we hope for and so that's something that i would really encourage um everybody to do especially young people like um adolescents too this is something and, and children just what is something this winter that is totally attainable that you are looking forward to, that you, that you also know you have the means to create in your life? Um, and then second, uh, there are, it's, it's un, undisputed uh, that a gratitude practice increases happiness. And that's, that's a deep gratitude practice, right? So that's, that's really taking stock on a daily basis in, in a small way, I mean, it can just be thinking, reflecting before you go to sleep or wherever works for you of the things that you are grateful for, um, large and small. Even just doing that every single day, uh, measurably and in a statistically significant way increases happiness in folks. So why not? I have some thoughts on positivity as well. I don't know uh, if anyone else is experiencing this or, or experienced this. When the pandemic started, I found myself uh, glued to that 24-hour news cycle, you know, for, for, for days and days, like just hoping that there would be some article that said it's over or we're, we're phasing up or it's getting better or there's a vaccine, like just just keep scrolling and hoping and that that was causing me so much more frustration than if I just read the news once a day, you know, like, so getting that phone shut down, uh, I'm avoiding uh, social media a lot more. And it's weird because they're saying, Oh, you need to find ways to connect socially. Well, I don't think the major social media outlets are, is that for me. Um, I also put an app on my phone where if I shake it, puppies come out or kitties or something. it'll have like cute pictures on the phone, you know? <laughs> so uh, it's, it's an app where when you've had too much 
bad news, you can just rattle your phone a little and it'll show you uh, kittens and stuff, you know? So I've, I've used, I've actually seen a lot of kitties and puppies and stuff the last few weeks because I'm shaking, shaking and looking, you know? But uh, yeah, I think that avoiding that news cycle is really crucial, you know? Be informed, but don't be glued to it. And, um, and uh, we will be sure to include that app link that Richard is talking about <laughs> yeah. in our, um, yeah. You know, the puppy. Yes. Yeah, go ahead, Paul. Sorry. It's called eye bleach. Oh, I just, um, I was just going to chime in a little bit uh, about, um, you know, thinking, thinking positively is different, is, is a different direction than thinking negatively. And it's good to be like, take um, stock of how, how often you feel like you're pulled into um, that sort of negative thought process. And again, the, the mind really loves repetition and, and we can increase feelings of anxiety and despair by our negative, our negative thought process. And um, I like what Richard said earlier, and I think Amy mentioned this too about, um, and I, I can't, I can't, quote the quote, but it's something like an antidote, an antidote to despair is to learn something new, is to try something new. Is there, and so like Richard's like trying a new recipe or um, learning, learning more about um, something that you've wanted to dig into before and, and searching for those stories of, of hope because they're out there. There's the human experience is, is everything is happening all at once. And there's lots of beautiful things happening, both, <laughs> you know, in our natural world and in the human world. And if we, if we turn our focus towards that area, we will, that's something that we'll benefit from. And um, yeah, so um, taking, taking, noticing, oh, the other thing I was going to say is that a lot of my practice is around the body, somatic practices, and things like anxiety and depression, we use those words, but they are, they actually have feelings in the body. And so we were talking about how can we help our kids or our partners. Um, a lot of times we can get in the, the cycle of talking about how, you know, what's wrong, and I have anxiety, or I feel depressed. But learning about how the body, what, what the body is presenting, like anxiety, where do you feel it in your body? What do you notice? Being really curious about those things. And talking about anxiety doesn't necessarily increase anxiety. Like when we talk to kids and say, this is how the body works. And these are some things that you might feel in your body. You might notice there's tension in different places or that your heart is beating faster and that's the way the body responds to stress to stress and and no sometimes we avoid focusing on those those feelings in the body as if we're going to increase them but a lot of like the we are talking about substance use and things like that are a way of avoiding feeling what we're feeling in our body and it's okay to feel those things. And, and there are lots of practices out there to help us um, move through those feelings. Well said. Yeah, I love that, Paul. So one last question. Um, this is an experience that someone had. Um, I'm so angry, and I feel this way too, um, when I see people not wearing masks at uh, the market. Last time I was there, I confronted someone um, who was in the deli section, touching everything and laughing. He said he didn't need to wear a mask uh, because he was sure he wasn't sick um, and that I better leave him alone, uh, which I interpreted as a threat. The store owner said it was his right. Um, now I can't even walk into the store. How do I get myself uh, to have enough courage to walk back in the store? And what are strategies as we confront people who think differently about this pandemic? Um, as Amy knows, I feel very strongly about masks and 
uh, how do we live in harmony with people who are feeling differently? Um, I think it's different for everyone. I, I know that a lot of the fear and unknowing that people experience has to do with this perception of no control. And that when we see someone who is not making efforts to look out for us and we're face to face with that, it's yet another thing that we have no control over this other person. And I guess uh, it, there's no easy way to get there, but I, I think that there's some, some harmony in realizing that we, we never had control. It was an illusion all along. And so we just need to redefine what our boundaries are and what we do control, whether, and, and at this point, it's down to us and our skin, what's in our skin, our bodies, our minds, our feelings. We, we can't control other people. And, and, we'll, and it's maddening trying, you know? And so I guess whatever uh, self-study or self-help or avenues we can take to figure out that we're okay with just controlling us, that we don't need to feel in control of others or, or the big picture to be okay is, uh, is an approach that, that I would suggest. And avoiding them. <laughs> yeah, it's I, it's a hard one, and it's it's infuriating when you see that sort of lack of concern. Um, I think, you know, I think what Richard was saying is that we need to take care of ourselves, be as knowledgeable as we can about safe practices and best practices with regard to hygiene and um, uh, being in indoors versus outdoors, and 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 take care of take care of ourselves i think there is also a place for advocacy too like to um the store owner you know um you know if enough people said i want you to mandate there being masks in the store then maybe the store owner would uh change their policy the, a, a number of different businesses like that's already the case in san juan county like if you're indoors you have to wear a mask and um, now what's that it's a law now it's a law it's a law Not yeah awful. so um yeah getting into a direct conflict with someone um doesn't usually always go well um <laughs> and so you know like doing advocacy or getting someone else to talk to that person or avoiding that person um, because like Richard said we can't control in the moment what p other people's actions are but we can control ourselves and is it worth it to get into a conflict in terms of your overall sense of well-being that's a personal decision you know some where you have to make you know all of that is true and this is like you know the other part of it is that really um that's like an outlier most people are not behaving in this way and if you really look around the store most people are really trying to make an effort to practice social distance to be aware to be kind to be courteous that is really mostly what's happening so in terms of um just advising that person that's struggling to go back in the store is <clears throat> the next time that they do go into the store to really Keep yourself safe, be really prepared so that you feel like you're doing everything to protect yourself and really look around you and notice how many people are really trying um, to respect and, and give each other space and, and be considerate because um, if you open your eyes to those things, you often can see that that is the larger, greater picture. Okay, well, um... I think we're getting we're getting ready to wrap up, but I want to give everyone a chance. Um, if if there's anything that is like you really wanted to get to, and these questions didn't get you there, just the opportunity to say um, any final thoughts. Just to have compassion for each other, even the people we're mad at, you know, to understand that that could be how they're coping. That. Denial could be the only way they can handle it, you know, so 
do our best to, to be patient and have compassion for each other. Because uh, when this is over, we're all still going to be here and we're still going to be interdependent. And uh, it, it would be a shame to, to see a lot of bridges burned over the anxiety this is causing. Yeah, and I, I think I would, um, I would add that we, we know that the majority of people's response to crisis is resilient adaptation. And so knowing that it's, um, we, can, we can guarantee that our community as a whole will resiliently move through this experience. And, and for those of us who, who just recognize that we're struggling more, there are a lot of resources out there and a lot of people who are, are here to, to support you. And we are so grateful to all of you guys for the work that you have been doing. I'm sure that you have been working extra hard these last few months, just like everyone has. So uh, thank you for giving this additional bit of effort on a Wednesday evening um, to participate in this conversation. And uh, thanks to Catherine and the Prevention Coalition for helping to make this possible. Um, I think we're ready to say goodbye and take care, everyone.